Welcome to the Jenna Ellis Show, sponsored by Legacy Precious Metals. There has never been a better time to invest in precious metals. Visit LegacyPMInvestments.com. That's LegacyPMInvestments.com. And welcome to Jenna Ellis tonight. Kevin McCullough in for the vacationing Jenna, who picked the right day to get away. I'm coming to you from the news desk in New York, where earlier today at 1023, we felt an earthquake on the East Coast, an unusual thing for us out here. It was only a 4.8. If you talk to people in California, they'll say that's just that's just laughing stock when it comes to earthquake fare. But it sent a few rattles uh, throughout the uh, entire tri-state area and all the way down the coast to some people in the uh, Washington, D.C. area even, and as far north into Massachusetts. So a bit of a, of, a, of a rocky start to the day for those of us on the East Coast, but glad to be with you. Um, we've got a great show talking about a lot of important news stories tonight, and I hope you'll stay with us for the whole thing. Tonight, I'd like to start by um, examining this idea that when a Secretary of State wakes up and decides to just come out and say something, that there really should be more of a response than what we've seen. Kev, what are you talking about? Well, yesterday, Antony Blinken thought it would be a great idea to announce to the world that uh, in some way, NATO was going to see to it that Ukraine becomes an active member of the NATO alliance uh, sooner than later. Now, I don't know what authority he had to make that announcement. I don't know even what authority the United States had given him to speak on our behalf uh, to that uh, even desire. But I need you to understand tonight, friends, that if you're hearing this, there is significant worry about what Antony Blinken had to say. First and foremost, NATO is a very important organization for European partners of the United States. Now, it's true that when Donald Trump came into office, uh, they were not paying their fair share, and because of his get-tough-with-NATO approach, they soon started to. But here's the real problem. The United States still overfunds its representation within NATO to the amount of billions of dollars. And the problem with any new member coming into the alliance is that there is a binding agreement with each member nation that comes in. That agreement includes that member's self-defense in the event that they are attacked by someone outside of the alliance. Now think about that for a second. Here we are in the middle of a hot war between Russia and Ukraine. We've sent them billions of dollars in supplies and resources already. And now our Secretary of State, without giving it two cents worth of thought, says to the press that we're going to see to it that Ukraine becomes a NATO member. You're not hearing other NATO countries parrot this. This was, this was the United States that said it. And this was the Secretary of State for the United States acting on whose authority? If this is the position of the administration and the president, why wasn't there a notification given to the American people? If this is the will of Congress, how come nobody's d d addressed it? My hunch is, is that nobody knew that Anthony Blinken was going to say such a crazy thing and that he did it on his own. But here's another problem. When someone does, it is important for the president, who Blinken reports to, come out and clarify just what the heck he was saying. Now, if Anthony Blinken was speaking on behalf of the administration in a way that reflects policy and where we're going to go with this, Congress needs to be paying attention and immediately open up hearings. A at what point in time did we just randomly decide we're going to start doing things without the input of the people? But secondly, the fact that there's been no correction of Blinken's statement since then is also concerning. Is the White House asleep? Is anybody on duty when the, uh, when the cabinet decides to take action on things? And are we really ready at this point in time with all of the crises that we're facing as a country to engage in a hot war against Russia, a nuclear power, a power that we had an arms race with for uh, th three or four decades, and eventually we're, we're able to extricate ourselves from that. But here tonight, as we sit to this very moment, no such correction has been offered. What does that mean to the American people? Are we really going to decide uh, to, to take on a hot war with Russia without so much as the consent of Congress? 
Are we going to say to the uh, American men and women in uniform that we're going to send you into a fight that we don't have any direct special interest in? Why would Anthony Blinken say such a thing? There may be a very soft spot in Joe Biden's heart for Ukraine. There's a lot of money that he and his family have benefited from by having such a soft spot. I, I'm, not, uh, I'm not ruling any possibility out here. But to make such an absurdly bold statement without any backing authority, to have no other member of the administration address it, to have the White House ignore that it even got said, and beyond that, to have Congress seem almost uninterested in the fact that, Blink, that Blinken said it, kind of, uh, in, uh, kind of indicts everybody on duty in Washington, D.C. at this very moment. Why weren't there senators and representatives running to the podium saying, we're calling a press conference, this is not going to happen on our watch? Look, if Ukraine wants to join NATO, they may be a perfectly acceptable partner. But you can't take on a partner that is involved in a hot war. Not unless you're ready to put all of the NATO alliance into war with them. And no one in this country is ready to take on Russia, America vis-a-vis -vis the, uh, the North Atlantic Treaty Alliance, uh, going after uh, Russia in a, in a head-on-head -head collision. We're not ready for that. And why are we doing even the amount of uh, relief that we're doing now? Yes, what Putin did was terrible. And I believe firmly that if President Trump had been in office, there would have been no invasion of Ukraine. I also don't think Iran would have had the money that it gave to Hamas to launch the October 7th attack. Who knows what else is still in the making? By the way, uh, you also had Anthony Blinken in the last 24 hours also say, or no, John Kirby from the Pentagon also say that uh, we will never support Taiwan as an, as an individual nation. What is he smoking? We already support Taiwan as an individual nation. They've been an individual nation for some 40 plus years. And we have stood by them this entire time. Did Nancy Pelosi and Kevin McCarthy's trip to Taiwan that irritated the Chinese, did it count for nothing? Are we going to abandon all of the allies that we have and, and, and make alliances with people that are involved in hot conflicts? Who's in charge? Who's on duty? Why are we hearing about what, what this policy is before it's being announced to the entire universe? These are important questions. Anthony Blinken and Joe Biden owe the American people answers. And tonight, we need to be ringing their phones, making sure that they are going to account for these statements. If you'd like to help your uh, congressional representative to do just that, by the way, you can call the congressional switchboard at 202-224-3121. 202-224-3121. Call your representative and senator and ask them, demand for them to get answers uh, from the executive branch. And then keep this in mind. This is, the, this is the comparison in this election. You're going to have someone who wants to pursue a forever war or someone who wants to end them on November 5th. I'm Kevin McCullough. Stay with us. Much more straight ahead. Welcome back to Jenna Ellis tonight. Kevin McCullough in for Jenna as she's away just for today. She'll be back Monday. And, of course, catch me tomorrow night and Sunday night here on Salem News Channel. Uh, and there's lots to talk about for a Friday. It is a rather busy day. I just said in the opening monologue, Anthony Blinken kind of writing off the reservation yesterday, just announcing that Ukraine's going to become a member of NATO on whose authority. I have no idea how he made that statement. But there's lots of other foreign policy stuff that needs to be examined, not to mention the the least of which, uh, not the least of which, is the conflict in Israel, as uh, Benjamin Netanyahu is really not taking any advice from the Biden administration in any way as it pertains to their ongoing conflict with Hamas. Josh Hammer is the host of The Josh Hammer Show, and he's also the senior editor-at-large for Newsweek. Josh, welcome back. Uh, good to see you. Um, Netanyahu has the advantage of a unified country behind him saying, we don't really care what the West has to say about this. We need to make sure that Hamas cannot do this again. Um, do you expect the Biden-Netanyahu relationship to continue to deteriorate? Look, I don't think that Joe Biden and Bibi Netanyahu have really ever had a good relationship. I mean, going back many decades, you can look back to the 1980s, the 1990s. 
they, they've always been butting heads with each other. In fact, you know, Joe Biden likes to portray himself as this staunch Zionist. He he frequently discusses one of his earliest trips to Israel back in the 1970s when he was visiting with Golda Meir. It's a story that he likes to tell when he's feeling, you know, particularly Zionist or pro-Israel. But the record tells a very different story. In fact, it was actually in the early 1980s on a separate trip that Joe Biden took to Israel where he was threatening to withhold U.S. aid to Israel at that time. And at that time, it was actually then Israeli Prime Minister Menachem Begin, who famously said, sir, I am not a Jew with trembling knees. So, you know, in the Jewish community, that's a very famous line. It was a very well-known line. And it was actually Joe Biden's own threat to, to withhold aid that prompted it. That was 42 years ago now. It was 1982. So, you know, he's really never been this, this staunch friend that he portrays himself as. And he and Netanyahu certainly have not been fans of each other, I think, on a personal level for a, for a long time. They kind of have to get along because, to an extent, they actually both need each other. But it's certainly not a cozy relationship. Look, to your point, the Israeli people, and I was there. I was there in Israel. I guess it was, it was about three months ago now. I was there for a week in early to mid-January. The country is unified. The country is very unified, not necessarily on Bibi himself. Bibi himself is a controversial Correct. figure in, in Israel, but they are unified about the military operation in Gaza. At least the Israeli Jews, Israeli Arabs, more of a mixed bag. But the Israeli Jewish population polls about 75 percent. They say finish the job in Gaza no matter what. That means going into Rafah, extirpating the remaining Hamas battalion. So they have the advantage, to your point, while the United States continues to be riven by this whack a doodle administration on the one hand, but a commonsensical American people on the other hand that broadly still support Israel. Well, and the challenge there is that Biden finds himself in an, in an extraordinarily bad place, given that it's an election year, because he probably, if it wasn't an election year, could in some way say, I don't, I don't need to pay attention to the voices even within my own party. But when you've got Rashida Tlaib, uh, going out and recruiting people to vote against him in the primary by the hundreds of thousands in some of these democratically needed states like Michigan and Minnesota, et cetera, that puts him kind of back against the wall on one side. And then you've got the true lovers of Israel that are on the other side saying, you better not abandon our, our, big, our best ally on planet Earth. Yeah, look, so— I think more broadly speaking, Kevin, what you're seeing is that you're seeing the unraveling of the post-2008 modern Barack Obama intersectional identity politics democratic coalition. To your point, when it comes to the war in Gaza, you have him trying to appease his leftmost flank, the 18 to 35 voters who don't poll nearly as favorably on Israel as their generational peers from previous generations. He's trying to appease the Muslims, the Arabs in Dearborn, Michigan, and Minneapolis, Minnesota, the so-called new two-state solution, Michigan and Minnesota. He's trying to do all of that. On the other hand, the white working class, which has been rapidly fleeing to Republicans in the era of Trump since 2016, but Democrats actually still rely on the white working class a lot more than people realize. And the white working class, especially in a lot of key swing states, is still overwhelmingly supportive of Israel. And this is just one of the many issues where I think they find themselves between a rock and a hard place. The immigration issue actually domestically would be another issue where I think he's trying to make everyone happy simultaneously making no one happy because as is so often the case when you try to appease everyone you end up actually pleasing no one but he's in a really difficult spot here and i'm not entirely sure what the calculus is because he clearly is going all in to win michigan he he really 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 wants to win michigan he wants to deny donald trump that blue wall there in michigan but again, the American people in Gallup and Pew polling still broadly support Israel over Hamas, as they obviously should. It is the obvious and emphatically correct stance, and the American people are not as far left on this issue as this adult administration is, and, and Tony Blinken himself certainly is. So I, I guess they're trying to shore up the vote in Michigan, but they're going to lose a lot more votes in states like Georgia, Arizona, North Carolina, and so forth. So I'm not entirely sure what the calculus is. I think it's going to misfire even on its own merits. We have heard from fellow Biden family members, specifically his wife, and other members of the administration and of his party, uh, directly criticize Israel again and again, uh, threatening, saying, you, you have to have a plan to show civilian safety, et cetera, et cetera. Why have not a single one of them said, on any level, including the president, said directly to Hamas, you want a ceasefire, put your weapons down. Put your weapons down and surrender, and the ceasefire is back in effect. There was a ceasefire in effect on October 7th, but we have not heard that. We have not heard him address the terrorists and say, no, you brought this on, you fix it, and, we, and we'll, we'll have peace again. 
And the fact that he hasn't done that when there are five remaining U.S. hostages yep. among the 100 plus that are still there, this is a little mind boggling to most Americans. I, it's simply disgusting. I mean, it's worse than mind boggling. I mean, I was going to make the point that you just made. There are still at least five remaining U.S. citizens who are currently being held hostage. Hamas, by the way, lest I need to remind the audience, Hamas is still an FTO, a U.S. State Department recognized foreign terrorist organization. That has not changed. Hamas has been an FTO for decades now, and it's an FTO for the very simple reason that their organizational charter, when it was when it was, when it started in the late 1980s as the Palestinian Arab offshoot of the broader Muslim Brotherhood, Hamas is institutionally dedicated to murdering every Jew around the world and eradicating the state of Israel. And by the way, after the don't, the Jews, they'll obviously come for all the other self-identified infidels, meaning Christians, Americans, Europeans, and so forth as well there. But I mean, how is this not such an obvious no-brainer for any American administration acting with the, the, the most bare minimum of any kind of moral and legal yeah. and human decency? You support our ally when they are trying to get our own hostages back against a U.S. recognized foreign terrorist organization. It, it, it just baffles the mind. It's crazy town stuff. We have stuff. to leave it there, Josh, it. but uh, good insight as always. Thank you for being with us. Read them in Newsweek and listen to them on the Josh Hammer Show. Kevin McCullough coming back from New York. Stay with us. Welcome back to Jenna Ellis tonight. Of course, this is not Jenna Ellis. She is away for the evening, and we'll be back on Monday. Uh, Kevin McCullough, who you would normally find at this time slot on Friday, on Saturday and Sunday nights, uh, glad to be in for her. Uh, we are still uh, rattling, uh, shaking, and humming here in New York City at the news desk. But uh, so far, so good in terms of the aftershocks of the earthquake, and we'll update you on anything that changes as that goes along. Uh, my next guest is here to discuss one of the issues that I think is going to be on the ballot in 2024, uh, and the reason why is because parents have felt largely um, attacked by the current administration when it comes to dealing with the issues of transsexuals and non-binaries, particularly in the school systems. Uh, Oren McIntyre joins us. Uh, he's a columnist and a commentator. Oren, it's good to have you. Thank you for being here. In a past life, you also worked as a public school teacher. And of course, when the Biden administration came into power three years ago, one of the first things they did was to, in essence, blackmail public school funding, saying, we're not going to let you feed your poor kids for breakfast or lunches anymore uh, if you do not uh, affirm and uh, help them explore options when it comes to transitioning. Um, in 2020, though there wasn't a red wave at the top of the ballot, a lot of school boards did change hands. There were parents that were mad about this. Are they still going to be mad about it in 2024? Yeah, I think it's going to be a key issue. As we've seen, the Biden administration pushes this at every opportunity. We just had him declare Easter a day of trans visibility. And let's not forget that when a shooter went into a Christian school and murdered three children, six people in total, he cited with the trans community. He said that trans children were the soul of our nation. So it's been very clear what Biden makes a, a uh, priority when it comes to pushing this agenda. They realize that the parents' control over their children, a parent's ability and sovereignty over what their children learns in their identity is one of the key barriers to the left's power. And so they want to make sure that they can break that down, especially inside the school system. And that's how historical Marxism came about, is it not? Um, when when the state could control the mind, in essence, rock the cradle, uh, they could they could force uh, kids to grow up thinking the way they wanted them to think. Yeah, that's exactly right. Every totalitarian state has to break down that final barrier between the parent and the state's ideology. The parent is the last line of defense against this kind of indoctrination. And so if they can go ahead and break that sacred bond between parent and child, they can violate that sacred trust, then they have total control of the state. They can literally make people believe anything. And if you can't, if you wanna you know, look at the ridiculous nature of this, trying to get men to believe that they can become women or vice versa, if you can force that onto children at age six, seven, eight, nine, then you really do have total control of how people are raised and what they can believe in. And this is being done, I just want the viewers to understand, this is being done with um, 
probably the least amount of science that we've ever had in terms of determining public policy. In fact, the NC2A, um, just a couple of weeks ago, had to admit that before they allowed Leah Thomas and some of the other athletes to compete in the women's division of their uh, sports, that they did almost no research in terms of the impact that uh, having them participating in that would actually end up having. There was one high school basketball team that had to forfeit the second half of a game on their way to the playoffs uh, in the month of March uh, for their state tournament because a male playing on the other team was so violent that he injured three of the of the you know six players that they had. They didn't have enough to to field a team for the second half in in a game that was vital to their season. Or this is not just some whimsical idea that, you know, magic fairy dust is, is sprinkling on people. There are real consequences to what's being done here. Yeah, this is absolutely has no science involved. A new study just came out showing that most children who have severe gender dysphoria simply grow out of it. But I don't understand how that changes anyone's mind, because if you needed science to tell you that it was unhealthy for male children to pretend to be female or vice versa, then you just had no common sense. You had no ability to reason. You were already deeply bought into the ideology of the regime. And of course, this is what they want. They want to be able to fundamentally change people at the most basic level. This is all about social uh, social engineering and control. If you can go ahead and get people to utter this kind of nonsense, then you can get them to believe in anything. And in a way, this kind of nonsense is like a uniform. It allows people to recognize others who are completely bought into the regime ideology. And so that's why they want to go ahead and compel this speech at every opportunity. That's why they're threatening parents. That's why they're using the school system to manipulate children, because they understand, again, if they can break that bond, if they can break that just connection to reality, then they can go ahead and shape the population to believe whatever they want at a moment's notice. Yeah. Well, it's <clears throat> discouraging. Now, let's let's move to the practical part of this conversation do you foresee this being an issue that parents are going to be voting on uh, in November of this year? I think it will be an issue that they're voting on, but I think many parents are intimidated into not speaking out. Again, I taught in a high school classroom, and one of the things that you saw about this is kids knew how this was treated as sacred inside a classroom. Kids who otherwise would violate every norm, who would push every boundary, knew to never question the pronouns of a trans kid. They knew that that was the one line they could not go ahead and transgress. And parents know this too. They know that if they speak out, they say something, especially if their child is uh, is showing some of these symptoms, uh, you know, that has this form of mental illness, then they could have the child stripped from them. We've already seen multiple parents lose their children, custody of their children, especially when there are divorced couples. The custody battle comes down to who will affirm the gender and who doesn't. And so they're terrified to speak out, but the one place they can speak out is the ballot box. And this is one of those things that happened with Trump last time. A lot of people who wouldn't say they'd support Trump publicly ended up voting for him privately when no one is around, no one is to hold them accountable for it, because that's the one time they had a voice to say, this is not going to keep happening to my kid. I was very encouraged. Um, I was hearing from Moms of Liberty and some other groups going into the primary cycle this last year. I was very encouraged to see that President Trump adopted a series of talking points related to this issue uh, coming into the New Hampshire primary. And I think he's made it a, a mainstay stable of his campaign speeches since. This does need to be addressed, and we have to draw the distinction of the difference in the two candidates in terms of how they will handle this going forward. And we've had more than enough evidence that Joe Biden will continue to push it, regardless of its impact on people, especially kids, that uh, that are involved. Uh, Oren McIntyre, thank you for your good work. Thanks for being with us. We appreciate it. Thanks for having me. You got it. Kevin McCullough continues in for Jenna Ellis next. Stay here. So glad to have you with us on Jenna Ellis tonight on the Salem News Channel. Uh, Kevin McCullough in for Jenna as she is away for the evening. I'm battling some allergies, so please forgive my voice, but I, I feel better than I sound. So if, I hope that's encouraging. Uh, tomorrow night, though, uh, 
Saturday and Sunday night. I will be in this same spot, 9 p.m. for that Kevin show, and I hope you'll join us then. Uh, finally tonight, uh, I want to turn to another red hot button issue for the election. We talked about the economy. We talked about foreign policy. I mean, we didn't talk about the economy. We talked about uh, social issues. We talked about foreign policy. But the economy is without question going to be on the minds of people, or is it? One of the things that the administration is very perturbed about right now, and when I say very perturbed, I've, they, this really gets their hackles in ways that few other things do. They swear to us that this economy is doing great. They, they, they swear on a stack of Bibles that it couldn't be any better if anybody else was there. The only problem with that is that most Americans seem to remember those first two and a half to three years of the Trump administration and how it seemed to work a lot better than it does now. Here to discuss is Tho Bishop from the Mises Institute. He's the content manager for them at that uh, establishment, and they look at all sorts of free market uh, issues as it relates to uh, economic growth. Uh, Tho, it's good to have you on the show. Um, The Bidens literally get testy when people ask them questions about the economy not being what people would like it to be. Why are they so short triggered on this? Well, the problem is we have a modern economy built upon gaslighting the public about the health. I mean, if if you're not, you know, the only people that think the economy is going well are PhD economists, a few pundits at the New York Times, and the Biden administration. And what's interesting, we just had come out today, uh, new jobs numbers that, you know, this has been the big selling point, right? Look how the jobs numbers, they keep growing, they keep growing. Well, now we have seen that over the past year, full-time job numbers are actually decreasing from where they were a year ago. And so one of the big data points, right, one of their big selling items is look how many jobs are created. And the problem is, and this has been a trend for a while now, you break down those job numbers. The majority of the job growth has come from part-time jobs, often people needing to take another job to uh, to make up for the inflationary pressures that are out there, and also government jobs, which produce nothing for the economy. Um, And so this has been the big selling point, and that once again took a hit today with jobs numbers that came out. But, 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 Tho Bishop, uh, we were told that the Inflation Reduction Act was going to handle all of that inflationary pressure. Right. We also heard from uh, various members of the Fed, you know, again, from Paul Krugman, that, oh, inflationary is transitory. It's just because of supply shocks getting out of uh, the, the COVID uh, pandemic. The, the government locked down the economy, and this was going to be a very passing issue. Um, the Fed has had to backtrack from it. Um, you know, they're trying to point to create scapegoats, right? Oh, it's, it's corporations that are, are just greedy, uh, uh, you know, taking advantage of the situation by increasing their profits. Oh, it's shrink fr- uh, shrinkflation, um, which is Biden's, uh, one of his big topics. The problem, of course, is that what we've seen is massive money creation um, you know, from the Federal Reserve. And just as important is the spending side of it. Uh, you know, we just saw one of the largest debt offerings uh, the largest debt offering that the, the feds have ever created. Um, you know, we are still uh, at pandemic levels when it comes to debt finance spending right now. The Inflation Reduction Act has only been a, a driver of this. And so again, we have a Washington, D.C. that is completely addicted to debt. They're using that debt to try to keep up GDP numbers. The problem is, is that the amount of economic growth, even by that very flawed government-favored measure, the more spending is not keeping up with, they're not getting the bang for the buck that they used to, because again, there's so much debt saturated in this economy. And the really scary thing is not not just government debt, it's credit card debt, Um, all these other issues, increased mortgage uh, costs with with rate increases and the like. The entire economy right now is so saturated with, so addicted to this debt binge, and yet we're still not seeing the growth that they would like to see in terms of the GDP number. So I guess all around it's a made up system, which is why Again, the, the real purpose right now of so many professional economists is to try to convince the public that things are much better than what they're actually experiencing in their day-to-day lives. And that's never going to work because it do- doesn't matter what kind of smoke you blow at me. If I can't afford a, a carton of eggs when I go to the grocery store, I can't afford it. And they, most people across the country couldn't give two wits about what Paul Krugman says. So – the Bidens have backed their way into this uh, problem very specifically. But for people that are not necessarily initiated, kind of walk us through why it seems so much better, especially in the early part of Trump's administration, as opposed to where we are right now. What, what were the philosophical policy differences between the two regimes? 
Well, I think that the two biggest contrasts can be seen in the, the regulatory side. You talk to small business owners, right? And they, they would talk about just how much relief they felt during the Trump years, particularly after the eight years of the Obama administration, where you saw just an absolute runaway from the regulatory state, you know, declaring you know, ditches on your land as navigable waterways so the EPA can come in and you know, impose greater restrictions on how you can use your property. The other side, of course, was uh, the, the energy side of things. Um, energy prices are factored into a number of, of dynamics there. Um, and the other thing is that you know, even though you know, one of the problems that we did have you know, that included during the Trump years, and there's been a bipartisan consensus on too much spending, too much debt, um, you know, what we saw, what, you, you, the pre-pandemic spending, as bad as it was, is still, you know, looks very humble relative to everything we've seen after the COVID pandemic. And it's the inability, even with you know, Republicans control of Congress, this is what's fueling, I think, a lot of the chaos right now in Congress, is that anyone that attempts to even just restrain spending back to where it was before the pandemic, which you know, this, is, this is what used to happen, right? You have massive spending during World War II, you know, during these times of crises, and then it'll go back afterwards. Well, modern Washington is so addicted to ensuring that no crisis can be allowed to revert back to pre previous spending levels, that there is no governor on that dynamic of it. And so again, it's just running more and more and more money out of DC, which ultimately is always has to come at the expense of taxpayers. Again, this is what's fueling the inflation. Yeah. This is what's fueling tax pressures. It's, it's that, that combination there. And again, until we get the regulatory relief, you know, another round of tax relief, these issues that I, I think you would, exceed, you would see with the change in the administration, we're gonna continue to see these costs that every American are, pay, are paying for right now. I, I think you're right. And I think that regulatory actions, there's no doubt about it. He's put in some 2,000 plus uh, regulations on businesses uh, that Trump had repealed. Um, but the, the, and you just let this slip by kind of quietly, but the energy piece of this I think is enormous because we were an energy exporter in the Trump years, we were making money off of the energy that we could produce uh, to a degree that we were taking care of our own people and going above and beyond that, making money off of it. And when we cut that, when we when we ended that supply, uh, we declared war on ourselves for the most important cost in production total. Uh, uh, energy production powers everything that we do. Anyway, uh, Tho Bishop, thank you so much for your insights tonight. We appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Kevin McCullough coming right back from New York. Stay here. Welcome back to Jenna Ellis tonight. Final few minutes. Kevin McCullough, glad to have you with us. Jenna will be back Monday night. Uh, look forward to that. And I'll be with you the next two nights at the same time, uh, nine o'clock. Uh, in the evening, East Coast on Saturday and Sunday night with That Kevin Show. Hope you'll check us out. All right. Final interesting story tonight. And I think it says as much about what it does say as much as maybe what it doesn't. But let me just make the case. Have you ever heard of the Utah Royals? I hadn't either. Uh, they are a women's professional soccer club based out of Salt Lake City. Um, and they have come under fire because their jerseys have something uh, patently offensive written on them. Um, the, the actual, the jersey actually reflects the name of the stadium that they play in. And in the name of this stadium, there is this horrifically offensive term that does appear. And leftists are now claiming that this team is representing fascism and racism. Well, what's the expression that could be so torturous and so impactful that it would cause uh, fascism and racism to uh, expound because it was on the jersey. Here's, here's what it is. The jerseys say America First Credit Union. That's all it is. They play at the America First Credit Union Stadium, and they are the Utah Royals that play at the America First Credit Union, and that's written on their jerseys. It's actually even written in quite small uh, font. It's, it's hard to even see at a picture of any kind of distance from the actual player. The credit union was founded in 1939 as the Fort Douglas Civilian Employees Credit Union, but changed its name to the Federal Employees Credit Union. Get this, not in the 2000s when Donald Trump was making the America First phrase something meaningful. No, they changed it in 1947. Uh, it, they moved to Ogden, Utah. The Fort Douglas name didn't seem to fit any better, and so they changed it to America First Credit Union. 
in uh, 2022, uh, Axios noted that uh, the stadium, the home stadium for the Royals, was renamed America First Field uh, along with it. The America in our name denotes our connection to founding members, civilian federal employees who worked at the military bases and defense depots in Utah. That's who the credit union was initially open to, people that serve the country in various capacities as employees, as uh, military members, etc. Those early members, deep and abiding sense of service and patriotism is something that continues to be felt within the membership today. Adding that first referred to putting the financial needs of their members at the forefront. Again, America First Credit Union. After an account claiming to represent supporters of the North Carolina Courage posted on X, we must weigh in on the Jersey controversy while we support all the Utah players and their fans. We can't stand by without mentioning the front of the Jersey sponsor, America First Credit Union, of our opponent, the Royals. The phrase America First has had a long history rooted in racism, fascism, and hateful ideology. Really? When you hear the words America First, you think of racism and uh, a long history rooted in fascism and hateful ideology? How is it hateful to put America first? Because when America does well, when they are actually putting Americans first and America is productive and we're actually prosperous, the whole rest of the world does really well. You know when the rest of the world doesn't do so well? It's when America's not doing well. When we're struggling with our own GDP, when we're struggling with our own ability to produce and sell, when we're struggling with our ability to secure energy at a good price, the rest of the world has it worse than we do. Because America's generosity oftentimes leads to other portions of the world doing quite well as well. So here's the, here's the real bottom line. Utah Governor Spencer Cox responded, saying, just when you think this website can't get any more ridiculous, I had to double check to see if this was a parody account or not. Good for him. The Utah governor is doing the right thing. There is no shame, nor should there be, nor has there been any type of history rooted in racism, uh, fascism, connected to the term America first. It is simply the simple concept of saying we're going to, as public officials, put the interest of Americans first before we meet the needs of other countries that are outside our borders. We're going to concentrate on making sure that the country inside our border is taken care of. Now, I know this is a tough concept for people to grasp. It's very difficult to understand how <clears throat> when you've been told for a long time that America's evil, that uh, its, its roots are evil, that uh, its intentions are evil, it's hard to understand how putting America first could be a good thing. But it, is, it doesn't get more simplistic than this. The poorest of the poor in our country are still doing better than the poorest of the poor everywhere else on planet Earth. And if we help lift those who are in poverty in America to a better standard, guess what? They have more exposable and in, disposable income. They have more possibility of doing good in the world around them than other people would of their same stature elsewhere. And if that's true of the lowest uh, income brackets in the country, imagine how much good is being done on a daily basis from America's middle class and upper middle class and upper class. The truth is, Americans' generosity in terms of the amount of good that they do is directly tied to the amount of expendable income that they have. It always has been. And when America is generous and helping Americans get ahead and succeed, then the rest of the world gets ahead and succeeds as well. It is really kind of uh, mind boggling that you have someone uh, that would object to a concept of saying that America should come first. Now, I know that this is objected to because the president himself does not like this phrase and his policies represent that. In the Joe Biden era, we have had America take the last spot on the bus, but at the back of the line, repeatedly holding the door open for everyone else while telling our own citizens it can't be done for you. That's why we have econ economic insecurity right now. That's why we have an energy crisis to the degree that we have. That's why crime is out of control, because we're not coming up with policies that put America first. And that's troubling on a lot of levels. It's not surprising that people that dislike America would say, I have a problem with America first. But if you are a citizen of America, you should be liking America. No, this isn't 
rocket science. So again, where's the objection to putting America and its priorities for its people above everyone else if you're an elected leader in America? There's nothing wrong with that. In fact, it does moral good when Americans put Americans first. When they succeed, they turn that generosity outside our borders. And I believe that's the way it should be done. So I would argue that I want America to be first because I want the world to succeed. And if America doesn't come first for American politicians, the world will not be in a better place. I'm Kevin McCullough. Thank you for letting me sit in with you tonight. We'll talk to you again soon.